The Tom Woods Show, episode 587. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you are looking for more libertarian podcasts, then I recommend the Jason Stapleton program hosted by my friend Jason Stapleton. Monday through Friday, he gives you an hour's worth of libertarian analysis of the news of the day. Check it out at jasonstapleton.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here, talking to Matt Lewis today about the Republican Party. Now, Matt and I are not exactly from the same point of view, but that makes things fun. He's a good guy and a friend, and he's got a brand new book, and it's called Too Dumb to Fail, How the GOP Betrayed the Reagan Revolution to Win Elections and How It Can Reclaim Its Conservative Roots. Matt Lewis is a writer, a CNN political commentator, and a blogger with The Daily Caller. He's also a contributing editor for The Week. He currently hosts his own podcast, Matt Lewis and the News. He was named one of the 50 best conservative columnists by Right Wing News in 2013, 14, and 15. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, Tom. Great to be here. I'm a huge fan of the podcast and uh, delighted to be on the show today. Well, I couldn't be happier as well. Uh, We were just saying before we started that I've been on your show and I've used that appearance as an episode of this show. So I'll link that. If people just can't get enough of the Woods-Lewis rapport here, then we will give them more of what they want at tomwoods.com slash 587, where I'll link to the chat uh, that I used as an episode of my own show. No, I just want to say, not to uh, suck up, but I'm a huge fan of the show. Um, Love love the, the, the history. I mean, you can learn from it. And the fact that you can have you know, civil and smart discussions and not get mad at people if you don't 100% agree. It's so rare and so appreciated. Well, I, I appreciate that. That's that's very kind. All right, let's talk about your book, Too Dumb to Fail. First of all, I don't quite understand the title. Explain yourself. So this is the phenomenon whereby if a candidate or a pundit says or does something stupid or crazy, they actually go up in the polls. And it's also an allusion to the the Andrew Ross Sorkin book, Too Big to Fail, about the financial crisis. In that case, you had these perverse incentives where financial institutions took on risks um, and collectively we all ended up having to pick up the tab. And I see the same thing happening in the Republican primary um, where you have these perverse incentives. If I'm a politician, uh, I have an incentive to say or do something stupid. I'll go up in the polls even though collectively I think conservatism and the Republican Party suffers. It's really the tragedy of the commons problem in in game theory. And this is really happening uh, with punditry. You know, when Ann Coulter calls Muslims ragheads, you know, she she does well. She sells more books. uh, She gets buzz and and attention. But um, collectively, I think that it, it does harm conservatism and Republican candidates. You know, I don't like political correctness any more than the next guy, and I think it's stifling and terrible and totalitarian, but I do encounter some people, especially conservatives, who feel like just being a boorish, disgusting human being is, you know, they're being, they're being, unjustly put upon by political correctness and so they're going to respond by just being boorish and and over the top offensive and i even i hate using the word offensive it's such a girly word frankly but but you, but you know what i'm saying i mean that that phenomenon is all over conservative punditry i mean ann coulter might even be the least of the offenders a lot of these youngsters think that they're going to show how tough and conservative they are by showing how obnoxious and boorish they can be i don't really want to deal with people like that like that's their big issue can i be as obnoxious as possible like that's your stand for liberty yeah i mean i couldn't agree more i think look political correctness is run amok and i hate the whole like word police people who are hypersensitive and as george carlin used to say they want me to call that thing in the street a person hole cover um that is ridiculous on the to me it comes down to motives what are your motives? If you are saying or doing something because you believe in free speech or because, frankly, you're just trying to communicate a message that you believe in, I'm okay with that. My concern is I think there are a lot of people now, it's a cottage industry of people 
who are their motives are not pure and actually they're it's selfish they're attempting to be provocative and controversial and if it hurts the conservative cause or the Republican Party and by the way I know you know I am a conservative uh, I, I do have some some libertarian leanings um, but I am a conservative and uh, and I think that it's worth the fighting for I think it, it's conservatism you know in, in the in the tradition of Edmund Burke and even Aristotle it has a proud intellectual tradition and it bothers me when people I think exploit it uh, for their own personal gain I want to talk about how you begin the book, you give a very basic and brief overview of the history of the conservative movement in the United States. And then you get to the 1964 election, you talk about Barry Goldwater, and you say, and I'd like to hear you flesh this out, that this is where the seeds were sown for one of the problems that the conservative movement has today, which is an, a strain of anti-intellectualism. And you're, you hasten to point out this is not something Goldwater himself would have wanted. Goldwater himself was a reasonably serious thinker. So what exactly do you mean by that? How did that come out of the Goldwater campaign as far as you see it? Right. So I admire Barry Goldwater. And I mean, and, and if it wasn't for Barry Goldwater, you don't get Ronald Reagan. So I think that conservatives and Republicans, um, you know, at the time, of course, and by the way, this is the interesting thing, Tom, I'm old enough to remember when the establishment were these moderate, Rock literally Rockefeller Republican liberal types. Uh, and now the establishment, I guess, is the club for growth somehow, you know. <laughs> um, so while th things have really changed, I do think one of the interesting things that happened in the, the 1964 campaign is that you know, Barry Goldwater runs, um, and, 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 if, and if John F. Kennedy had lived, it could have been a very high-minded campaign about ideas. There was talk about Kennedy and uh, Goldwater traveling the country together, doing these kind of Lincoln-Douglas-style uh, debates. But instead what happens is uh, you have JFK assassinated, and you have Lyndon Johnson become the Democratic nominee, and he ran this scorched earth campaign. We all remember the infamous Daisy ad where he went after Barry Goldwater and tried to cast him as this lunatic who would bring about a nuclear holocaust if he were elected. It was a really scurrilous and, and just horrific example of negative campaigning against Barry Goldwater. But what happens is after that race is over, Goldwater gets 38, just 38 percent of the vote, and I think he won six states. And a lot of the activists who had you know, come out of the Goldwater movement, some of them actually disappeared. They became disenfranchised and frustrated. They left politics forever. But some of them actually decided, well, let's try to learn from this experience. Let's learn how we can win in the future. And they basically came to the conclusion that being right isn't enough to win, that being philosophically correct isn't enough to win, um, and that the way to win is to study political technology, how to, you know, how do you knock on doors? How do you run TV ads? How do you organize and communicate? And there's nothing wrong with that. That's very, you know, participation in democracy is very noble. And so a lot of the Goldwater folks who came out of it simply became better campaigners, better organizers. They started think tanks. They started training activists. But I do think there was a negative message that came out of that, which is that negative politics it works, is that you know, if, if, if they're going to accuse us of these horrific things, we, you know, if they're going to bring a knife to a fight, we have to bring a gun. You know, they put one of us in the hospital, we put one of theirs in the morgue. And I think that that really did sow the seeds of the beginning of this sort of dumbing down of politics. It's not about ideas. It's about campaigning and organizing. Right, right. Yeah, I, I can see that. I, I could definitely see that. Now, I, I'm particularly sensitive about this claim about uh, negative campaigning. Because I think it really, really got started that people really focused on negative campaigning and criticized it in the 1988 election when you had George H.W. Bush and Mike Dukakis because Bush ran this notorious ad about Willie Horton who was a criminal who went on to, I don't know, commit some horrific crime while he was out on furlough under Mike Dukakis's prison furlough program in Massachusetts. And this was just declared to be totally out of bounds. But in general – I, I thought there wasn't enough negative campaigning in the sense that I lived in Massachusetts. I knew the truth about Mike Dukakis. Nobody else seemed to, except those of us in Massachusetts. He was going around saying 
we had this Massachusetts miracle of economic growth, and, and I want to bring that to America. What he left out was he vetoed and fought against every single leg of the program that gave us that economic growth. I mean, he was, he was an obstacle that stood in the way of every good thing that had gone on in Massachusetts, and we wanted people to know that. How are you going to convey that without a negative ad? Oh, totally. And I mean, you know, what's the alternative, right? Banning negative ads and stifling free speech and free expression. I mean, that would be the that would be the worst backlash. And I mean, as you know, you know, negative campaigning has been around forever. You go back and look at what, you know, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson said about each other. Uh, in some cases, it makes uh, today's politics look tame in comparison. But having said that, I do think it's part of the story about what happened to conservatism. I mean, there was a time when conservatism was actually considered to be too intellectual, too full of these, you know, whether it was uh, Bill Buckley or Hayek or Russell Kirk, too uh, populated by these, you know, these intellectuals who were, you know, removed from from Joe's six pack, you know. And I think that this is the beginning of the story, at least of, of the modern story of how we go from. Uh, the party of, of uh, you know, the, the movement of Edmund Burke and the party of Ronald Reagan to uh, Sarah Palin endorsing Donald Trump and giving that crazy endorsement speech about this is for holy rollers and rock and rollers. Um, I think that's part of the story as to how, how we got to where we are today. But at the same time, I think even though I think National Review has fallen, you know, to a much lower level than it used to be. I mean, I mean, imagine a magazine. Whether you agree with these people or not, imagine a magazine featuring James Burnham, Russell Kirk, um, uh, Frank Meyer, people like this on a regular basis. And I just don't think it's there's even a comparison to what they have today. But yet, the Trump phenomenon is clearly a rebuke of this. Of the conservative movement, it, it it is a, which I think some people view as still being too intellectual. It's got it still has its think tanks, it still has its highbrow magazines, but we are here in the heartland and we're connecting to this regular, well, <laughs> regular guy, multi billionaire, but we're connecting to somebody who just is plain spoken and just doesn't give us the same old Mitt Romney talking points that we keep getting from you people every four years. I, I mean, it, I don't think we can just say, well, anti intellectualism swept the board inexplicably and now what are we going to do it's i mean these people are to blame the, the the product the conservative movement is serving up to the general public is not an impressive one yeah i, I think there's a whole bunch of factors that have culminated that help explain the rise of donald trump some of what i think is barack obama's disastrous presidency some of it i think is you know nominating people like mitt romney uh who you know look my dad was a prison guard my dad would have probably held his nose and voted for Mitt Romney. But what was it? Mike Huckabee said something about, uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was like Romney doesn't remind you of your dad. He reminds you of the guy who fired your dad. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm slightly off with the paraphrase, but it was it, it was it was somewhere in there. And it was it was pretty, uh, pretty astute. Um, so I think that there's there are a lot of people to blame. Um, I, I look, I, I love the fact that that and I write about this in the book, the, the Frank Meyer um, fusionism uh, and, and, and the way that conservatism, um, you know, sort of came together and, and infused traditionalists and um, and libertarians. Uh, and it was very diverse. And, and um, it's become, I think, less diverse, probably more of a neoconservative consensus, at least on foreign policy. And I think that's certainly part of the story. I do think that Donald Trump is tapping into uh, an anger and a frustration out there, uh, mainly among working class white Americans who believe the American dream have left, has left them behind. You used to be able to graduate from high school, get a factory job, make $15 an hour, provide a middle class lifestyle for your family. Those days are gone. You can blame automation. You can blame capitalism if you're on the Bernie Sanders left. You can blame uh, immigration. You can blame uh, you know all sorts of things. Globalization. There, there are a lot of boogeymen here uh, that I think are partly responsible. But you know, Tom, I've been listening to your podcast, and um, one, of, I, you know, I share a lot of your concerns about Trump, even though I'm respectful of of a lot of the good Americans. And by the way. You know, even the best of families have Donald Trump supporters. I, I, you know, I, I among uh, 
you know, I have a brother-in-law, for example, who's a Trump supporter, a great guy, a smart guy, uh, I think misguided. Um, I will say among the many concerns I have for Trump, I think I share with you the concern that he has these authoritarian tendencies that I find uh, pretty troubling. Well, I think it's part of his personality. And it's it's a it is very much I think the the Teddy Roosevelt comparison is quite apt because his personality was very much that of a dominating figure who cast himself as the personification of the will of the people. So why should I in any way honor any institution that's standing in the way of me and the implementation of the will of the people? So I see some of that in Trump. But, you know, I have to say, Matt, I am having trouble getting as agitated about Trump as other people are, simply because my question is always, what's the alternative? What's the alternative that's being presented to me in the the race? Now, there is Ted Cruz, but Cruz and Trump are by and large struggling for the same block of voters. And that, as I had Dan McCarthy on the show uh, a couple of days ago, talking about exactly that and saying that that's what's opening the door for Rubio. Yeah. Rubio has the rest of the field. He's got the establishment. He's got neoconservatives. He's got people who are just uncomfortable with Trump and Cruz. He's got that whole field almost to himself and probably in a matter of days from now, uh, I, you know, just for all practical purposes, to himself. And when I look at Rubio, I – I just panic because I see I see another George W. Bush. I see a guy not particularly bright who's going to be dominated by almost certainly the very bad people he's going to put around himself. And if I'm somebody who is supposed to respect Edmund Burke, then I just cannot imagine what the compatibility is between that and the idea that the United States was created to be a global democracy spreading human rights. I don't see that those are compatible. Well, I would say that when it comes to foreign policy, I probably shake out most in the Ted Cruz camp. I'm I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I think it's a Reagan space, actually. And I don't mean it to be a cop out. But on one hand, I do believe that it's important for America to be, you know, this beacon of hope um, and, and, and to, you know, have a place in the world. On the other hand, I think that, you know, spreading democracy and adventurism is very dangerous. And um, there's really not much of a doubt that we're in a wor- we're worse off now as a ro- as a result of Iraq. I actually think Rubio. Uh, there is a lot that I like about Rubio. Um, I think he has a chance to actually. He's incredibly eloquent. I love his story about the American dream. You know, when he talks about how his dad was a bartender, and, and he says that journey from behind that bar to behind this podium is the essence of the American dream. I think it's powerful. I think that he's eloquent. I think it really resonates with a lot of Americans who aren't traditionally Republican or conservative. And I think that Rubio, if he were the nominee and if he were the president even, uh, you know, has a potential to um, to win over 21st century uh, voters who, you know, who I think um, might otherwise – think of themselves as liberals, uh, just sort of default liberals. And I'll tell you why. If you look at uh, – it's something I talk about a lot on when I talk about the book. But you know, the lady who, who gets on her smartphone and orders an Uber and you know, goes someplace and gets on the smartphone and now orders a StubHub, she should be a conservative because she obviously doesn't like onerous governmental regulation. Um, she's entrepreneurial. Um, she – you know, she's probably managing her own stock portfolio. I find it hard to believe she's going to trust the, a big bloated bureaucracy to manage her retirement funds. So she should be conservative, and I think she will be as long as her idea of what a conservative is isn't this cultural, you know, shortcut of you know, boss hog with a rebel flag flying in the in the pickup truck. And I think Rubio appeals to these kind of Americans. And I think Rubio could make the argument that look. What Hillary Clinton's selling is a 20th century command and control style uh, assembly line version of liberalism. Um, I think he's really kind of uniquely positioned to make that argument. I do share your concerns, however, and it's not a small thing. I do share your concerns about his foreign policy and his penchant for wanting to be involved in pretty much any skirmish. Um, I, I think I would like to see maybe a Rand Paul uh, in the administration whispering in his ear. All right, let's uh, pause for a brief message and come right back. 
Folks, I get a lot of requests from people. What am I going to listen to when I'm all done listening to The Tom Woods Show? What else is out there that I can listen to that will nourish me as a libertarian? And one answer I give is the Jason Stapleton program. It's hosted by my friend Jason Stapleton. Jason's been a guest on this show, and he runs that show Monday through Friday, just like me. But his show is an hour long every single day, and he sticks to current events. And he has a knack for taking complicated issues and explaining them in ways that the non-specialist can understand. So whether it's gun control or citizenship or the Greek bailout or some more technical and complex questions like that, he can explain it in a way that you can go out and argue the case with confidence. I was looking at some recent iTunes reviews of the Jason Stapleton program, and I found this one. There are many shows available that claim to enrich your life. The Jason Stapleton program actually delivers. Check it out at jasonstapleton.com. All right, we're talking about your book, Too Dumb to Fail, and you've got in here quite a few criticisms of different conservatives and different strains of conservatism and different what I think you consider to be dead ends in conservatism that are holding back its success. So pick one of those and let's talk about it. Well, so much to talk about. I I will say, you know, I started uh, about five years ago is when I started noticing the dumbing down of conservatism. And it was when you had like Sarah Palin, whom I originally kind of liked, went rogue. And and you had uh, Christine O'Donnell and Sharon Angle running. And they were playing this, what I would call um, identity politics card. And they were playing this victim card, you know, like, woe is me. We can't, these people, the establishment's keeping us down. And really that cuts against what I think of as a conservative, who, a rugged individual, somebody who finds a way to succeed. Um, and to me, that started this, this sort of dumbing down uh, problem. I, I, I am concerned about the, the, what's happened is we've lost sight of what real conservatism is. And what we have is this sort of these cultural shortcuts and what we think a conservative is. And we think it's sort of uh, somebody who is, um, you know, whether it's rural or whether it's somebody who lives in a McMansion, somebody uh, who, uh, you know, has the rebel flag in their pickup truck or whatever. Um, I'll just tell you one thing I write about in the book that's a, that's a, a, a weird departure maybe, but I find it – I think I think your audience would like it – is new urbanism. And even though that word, I, I don't, I don't love that term. Um, I am a fan of the sort of Russell Kirk. You know, he he talked about the uh, the car being the mechanical Jacobin, and this notion where you know, if you're a conservative, you don't have to live in a McMansion in the suburbs. You know, one of the things that that I enjoy is is, is living in a walkable community where you can walk to church, walk to bars, walk to schools, walk to restaurants. And this is an idea that I really got turned on to by um, Rod Dreher in, in his book Crunchy Cons. Um, so I know that's a lot of stuff to unpack. This maybe gives you a sense of, of how kind of far-reaching and I, and I hope interesting um, this book is. Well, it is an interesting book, and, and I have to say I, I find a lot to disagree with uh, in it, but I also find a lot to agree with. And I think, I think in many cases – the same annoying people annoy both you and me. So that's a, that's a very important thing to have in common. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, th- that stuff about the new urbanism is fine with me. I, mean, the, I read about it in the American Conservative magazine, for example. They have representatives of that in there. And that's fine with me. Um, I, I think that conservatism is, is really, though, so it is supposed to be fundamentally something that emerges that's small and local. Right. So exactly. that is a that's an expression of that yep. that you think about the actual neighborhood that I live right. in. Right. And, and, and but my the interesting point is if if you if you don't have a conservative worldview and if you don't if you're not familiar with that sort of Burkean the little platoons uh, form of conservatism, you believe what is conservatism? Well, it's what it, it's listening to Rush Limbaugh. It's driving a, a big SUV. Um, it's throwing your McDonald's wrapper out the window when you're done or whatever the negative stereotype is. And uh, I guess the point I'm making here is sort of illustrating that um, that real conservatism in a Burkean sense is really quite a departure. So when people – you know, this hasn't happened much. I've actually been really happy by the response of this book. It's been really well received by a lot of conservatives. I'm, I'm very happy with that. But the people who might say like, well – 
Matt's a liberal, Matt's a liberal or a rhino um, because he wants us to live it. You know, he wants to live in a walkable. You know, I don't want to tell anybody what to do. I don't think government needs to tell people where to live. But because I'm advocating this, these local community values, somehow that makes me a liberal. That just shows how far removed we are from actual like knowing what conservatism is. Let's talk about Ted Cruz for a minute, if we might, because it's interesting that you mentioned an affinity for him in terms of foreign policy, because I would say that Cruz is an example of, I mean, he's an example of a populist in a way, because he does make a direct appeal over the heads of the party leadership right to the public. So he has the populist streak, but he's not he's not one of these hay, ignorant hayseeds that, that seem to drive you crazy because there's nobody, even his worst enemy, who denies that he's very, very smart and he really knows what he's talking about, but he still has a populist style. So is it the populist style that offends you or is it the populist style that has no substance behind it? I would say the latter, but um, let me unpack this a bit because there's, there's a bunch of stuff to know. So first, I'm from a really rural community. Um, when, when people said in school, what do you want to be when you grow up? The number one, like kids raised their head, like the number one answer was farmer. The number two answer was truck driver. Um, my dad was a prison guard in Hagerstown, Maryland. That's kind of where I come from. And the reason that I don't like the Donald Trump thing is honestly, I feel like it's exploiting a lot of the good, hardworking America, like rural Americans that I grew up with. So it, it sort of viscerally bothers me, maybe in a way that if I was more cosmopolitan or Ivy League educated, it actually might not. I went to a little college in West Virginia. Uh, so these things hit us uh, uh, differently. I should probably also disclose that my, my wife actually was Ted Cruz's national fundraiser when he ran for U.S. Senate against David Dewhurst, um, uh, you know, back in 2012. So I just throw that out there um, for the sake of full disclosure. Um, look, I think that I have mixed feelings about Ted Cruz. Um, I think that he is he is you cannot deny he's a legitimate conservative. So unlike Ted Cruz, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Unlike Donald Trump, I have no doubt that Ted Cruz truly is a movement conservative. Um, I also think he's sanctimonious and um uh, and, you know, uh, in many cases has done things to advance his, his sort of ambition uh, that have actually hurt conservatism. Um, so, you know, look, if, if, if it weren't for Donald Trump, maybe this maybe Ted Cruz would be the villain in, in my book, Too Dumb to Fail. But in comparison to, to, to Donald Trump, you know, um, Ted Cruz looks like this really like uh, smart, eloquent um, reasonable conservative. So I think that, uh, I think my opinion of, of Cruz has probably gotten better in comparison to Donald Trump's candidacy. Let's talk about, uh, pundits in the conservative movement, because you have a, a subheading in, uh, in one of your chapters, how to succeed as a pundit parentheses without really knowing anything. Ah, yes. <laughs> I remember. And I, I feel like I shouldn't say the name cause I, I almost feel bad saying it, but there was a time in the past few years I was watching TV. There was a conservative pundit on who was so ignorant, so shockingly ignorant, that I actually opened up my computer and I said, I have to look up this person. I have to know what in the world got this person on television. So I know that uh, there, there must be plenty of others. In, in fact, it surprised me. It even sur I was still naive back, uh, I guess, about a dozen years ago. I was on uh, TV with Sean Hannity. And he had never before heard the argument that the New Deal may have retarded the recovery from the Depression. <laughs> now, I know that's not the mainstream right. historical opinion of it, but it's not like you know, there are no proponents of this view. This is the conservative view, and this was completely news to Sean Hannity. So it seems like – and I'm sure this is not exclusive to conservatism, although uh, – and, and we can find a lot of left liberals who are this way. I personally think libertarians tend to be more informed – about stuff because they're less fixated on politics all the time. I think people like Hannity feel like they're really well informed if they know the poll numbers and they know what the candidates are doing. But he didn't know any of this stuff, and that just blows my mind yeah. that that's our pundit class. It's amazing. I was I won't mention a name here, but I was on a different network, um, and during a commercial break, I was talking to one of the other panelists, and I mentioned um, Schumpeter and creative destruction. Oh, yeah. You may as well have been talking about quantum physics. <laughs> the host had no idea what we were talking about. And here's the scary part, Tom. 
I've actually found that in a way, the more you know, the worse you are on TV. Like knowing, having a lot of like information and nuanced opinions actually makes it harder to talk in sound bites that you need to do on TV. And um, I've actually feel like if you, if you were to chart my career as a TV pundit, I actually, I started off, I think pretty good because I didn't know anything. And then I actually went through a period where I wasn't nearly as good on TV because I like knew too much. And now I think I've finally figured out how to, um, how to sort of incorporate what I know, but not, not talk too much. But look, this is why podcasts are so awesome. This is why I have my own podcast. This is why I listen to your podcast because we can have this like long form, interesting discussions that you could never have on TV even on the most, I mean, maybe if it was like Charlie Rose or, or something like that, but there are very few shows where you could actually have like a really deep conversation, um, which frankly, I have to say, like as an author, it is so nourishing to the soul to actually get to talk about like the book, you know, it's, it's so rare sometimes. I, I, you know, I agree with what you're saying about, uh, you know, when you know a lot, you feel sometimes the need to insert so much nuance. Well, but don't forget this small point, and then there's this, and I don't want to overstate that. That's something you just have to train yourself out of when you're on mm -hmm. TV. Peter Schiff is very good at that. He's very smart. He can give you all kinds of detail. He can give you a great hour and a half lecture off the top of his head, which he did at the Mises Institute. He walked in, he looked at the topic for the first time, and then he just talked for an hour and a half, and everybody was completely spellbound. But he can go on TV, and he's got these brilliant analogies that are just perfect, and he can do it in sound bites, and it, he makes it look easy. But as you point out, it's actually really not particularly easy to do that. Yeah. So it's something you have to train yourself to do. It is ironic. It is almost like a inverse relationship between how much you know and how good you are on TV sometimes. Well, and I think partly, you know, when you have political candidates who have memorized a lot of good one-liners, it makes them seem better than they really are, seem like they have greater depth than they really have. But I still say that it can be done. You can have smart people who are – I thought – you know, even though I didn't agree with Bill Buckley all the time, I thought he had an excellent TV presence, and I thought he was pretty quick on his feet. I think Pat Buchanan is brilliant, and I think he can slice and dice you pretty well in 30 seconds. So there are exceptions to the rule, but unfortunately – it seems to be a pretty persistent rule. All right, so l let's say it's a lightning round now. All right. And you've got to just tell me, give me four problems or four mistakes that you see conservatives making and that if they corrected those mistakes, their fortunes would improve. All right, so I don't know if, if I can get through four, but uh, I'll give you a few. One, I think it's a mistake to double down on the populist thing. Um, right now there is a, a real temptation uh, to because because there is a, a a niche out there there's a uh, there is an audience for somebody who will play what I will call working class white identity politics and to feed the anger and uh, in some cases understandable anger and frustration out there but actually a lot of the Donald Trump fans are really if you look at the cross tabs not really that conservative they're for protectionism they're for you know all, all sorts of things that are really unconservative. I think that so number one, we have to resist this urge to immediately satisfy this demand, which I think in the short term might work. In the long term, I think would spell uh, – would, would be disastrous. Um, number two, I think we it, – it's incumbent upon us, those of us who are blessed to have a platform uh, and a megaphone to, um, to accept a certain – you know, with, with great power comes great responsibility. And just because we have the ability to be uh, provocative for the sake of being provocative and, and to be controversial, um, I, I think that we, we owe it to uh, – look, 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 this isn't sports commentary. I mean there are consequences to, uh, to political rhetoric. Um, again, I, I'm not an advocate of, of political correctness at all, but I think we do uh, need to be responsible um, – you know, to and, and to have our, our motives be pure. So that's sort of summoning uh, po politicians and pundits, uh, hopefully to our better angels. Um, those are two two of the things that I would strongly urge uh, is to resist these, um, you know, to resist the uh, the perverse incentives out there. Um, it's a quick fix, but you know, we we have to be better than that. 
Uh, let me say a quick thing about things being unconservative. The trouble that I keep identifying on the show here about conserv- the trouble with conservatism is that because, it, because it's not an ideology and therefore it, because it's not like a set of, of hard and fast rules that every society in the world has to conform to, the, the, there are benefits to that, but the disadvantage is it's, it's, it's harder to say, well, this person's not a real conservative because X, Y, or Z. In terms of protectionism, I think of all kinds of people who have been cited as conservative heroes who favored protective tariffs. Everybody from Abraham Lincoln to Teddy Roosevelt to the presidents in the 1920s, which were supposed yeah, to be Calvin, the most free Calvin markets. Bullage. Yeah, and even Ronald Reagan himself. I mean, 100% tariff on some Japanese products. So I, I think it's hard to say that's just unconservative. I would, well, this you, is where I my libertarian, Tom, say, this is where my libertarian strain comes in. I'm a, I'm a, I'm oh, a free market. Okay, but then, then you have to say those people, maybe they are being conservative and they ought to be libertarian. Yeah. Well, no, you're, you're absolutely right. It becomes a game of semantics. Um, I, I believe that, uh, you know, maybe it's my brand of, of, and you're right. It's it's hard to define because there's not a dogma, and it makes it harder. I mean, you know, I, I moderated a debate uh, a year or so ago at Cato between the Cato interns and the Heritage Institute interns, and you know they don't declare a winner, but I can just tell you the Cato interns won, and I think it was because it was just easier for them to have a sort of a black and white position on this is what we believe, this is – you couldn't sort of say, yeah, but what if this happened or this ex- – would you make an exception for this? I think the libertarian interns had a much clearer uh, line as to what they believed in uh, and what they didn't, uh, and there was a lot more nuance. It goes back to what I was saying before about the, the problem of nuance in a debate. Um, but no, you make a valid point. I, I clearly have uh, some some libertarian leanings. I'm I'm a free marketer. I'm I'm actually you know pro immigration reform. Uh, I I believe you know things like uh, we can grow the pie. Uh, that that more people equals more prosperity. And that version of conservatism, uh, my version, uh, I believe is really the best for human flourishing. I think that it, it'll make more people. Lift more people out of uh, out of poverty, make more people more prosperous, more happy, more more joyful. I do not think it contradicts the definition of conservatism, which says that we are to conserve the good things about Western civilization. Um, but no, you make a valid point that um, it's hard to define conservatism, and in some cases, it's in the eye of the beholder. All right, a couple of quick things before we wrap up here. In terms of more people means more prosperity. The, well, that certainly was the Julian Simon argument right. that h- human beings shouldn't be thought of as burdens because look what's between, you know, look what's in that uh, skull up there, right? They've got the potential to do extraordinary things. Uh, they should be thought of as a resource, not as a, as a burden. But at the same time, it kind of depends on who the people are because it's certainly – uh, theoretically conceivable that we could be talking about people who consume more than they produce. And if people consume more than they produce, how is more people going to produce more prosperity? So I, I don't think it can just be arbitrary, yeah. arbitrarily stated that, well, more people are going to – it's not necessarily the case. There are plenty of places in the world where more people is not producing more prosperity. Secondly would be, what about Pat Buchanan? Now, he was a populist in the 1990s, and he ran um, – a couple of memorable campaigns against, I mean, he ran against a sitting president in 1992, a sitting Republican president, and then he ran in 96, and he won the New Hampshire primary, and he was clearly running a populist kind of campaign. Yes, he was a protectionist, and I don't agree with that, but, you know, there are, it's funny, the, the Cato Institute people who will condemn you all day long for being a protectionist, they don't mind cozying up to central bankers and warmongers and whatever, so I'm not going to let them lecture me about my support for Pat Buchanan. I like Pat, and I actually do think he wanted to slash government – I mean way more than these fake movement conservatives say. They just want to raise money with their fundraising letters. I think he really wanted to do it, and I frankly loved his style where he just slashed and burned. I mean he had a good mind. He could give you a good intellectual argument, but he could also give the establishment a black eye. Why should I not find that? thrilling. Why should I instead say, well, I wish he had written a 10,000 word essay for National Review. Explain that. Well, I guess first let me just start by saying I I like Pat Buchanan a lot personally. Um, and, you know, just to share, uh, I don't want to betray any trust here, but um, I, I've, I've been around uh, places where Pat has, you know, worked and done TV commentary. 
And if you ask the makeup artists and the drivers, the sort of the regular people who make TV shows happen, um, who's the nicest to you? It's Pat Buchanan. Yeah, I've heard that so many times. It is. One um, one story was uh, he, uh, he, he asked, there was, there was a company who was doing some sort of service without giving it away for, uh, for one of the networks. And Pat sent at Christmas a check to every single, a Christmas card, and I think it was a $500 check to every single person who worked uh, at this company. And this is a very, you know, racially diverse company. And these are, are hardworking Americans um, who, who might think that Pat Buchanan's this horrible, like, fascist, you know, evil old white guy. Um, and Pat was, you know, whereas a lot of the liberals, you, you'll hear, I'm not going to mention any names, but you'll hear that they're not always so nice to, uh, to working people. Um, Pat has a well-deserved, great reputation for being a, a super nice guy. I also think he's like really good on TV. And I have to say, like, I don't know if it shows through, but there are probably like two or three people that I've tried to look to. And I don't want to say mimic, but model my TV uh, commentary on. And Pat, it was probably like Tucker Carlson, my boss, Pat Buchanan and PJ O'Rourke are like three of the people that I think really in, in very different ways uh, I admire and do it, do it well. Having said that, um, as much as I admire Pat and he's been on my podcast, you know, we just disagree um, in terms of our worldview. He, there, there's no doubt he's a solid conservative, that he fits well within the Reagan umbrella uh, of what constitutes a conservative in good standing. We just happen to be on very different ends. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a, you know, a libertarian free market uh, guy. Um, that's what I believe brings most prosperity. Um, I don't think we can build a wall and basically uh, stop globalization and, um, and and protect the the uh, the so-called good old days um, when you know in the wake of World War II after all of our competition had been destroyed, uh, where we can go back to those days where uh, you know the factory job, the fifteen dollar an hour factory job is is viable. Um, you know, I, I, I think that if you look, uh, I think a lot of the, a lot of the sort of glamorization of those halcyon days are actually misleading as well. I've heard, you know, I don't know if you ever listened to Russ Roberts podcast, which is great. Yeah, uh, once in a while. Econ talk. Um, a lot of the numbers are misleading. You know, the, our, our ability today to buy really good products at a cheaper rate uh, because of, of free trade, you know, David Ricardo's comparative advantage. That helps make make us all more prosperous. Um, you know, in many ways, the numbers are skewed. It, 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 there's a perception that that we were so much better off somehow in like the 1960s and 70s, and in many ways, we're much better off today than we were back then. All right, your website. Tell people what your website is. Well, I have a little website of my own, mattklewis.com. Um, but I'm actually a writer for the Daily Caller, and uh, I contribute to a lot of places, including uh, the London Telegraph, Roll Call, The Daily Beast, TheWeek.com. Um, but if you want to listen to my podcast, it's called Matt Lewis and the News. And uh, I've had great guests, including Thomas E. Woods and Patrick J. Buchanan. And they can find the podcast also at MattKLewis.com? Yep, MattKLewis.com and or on iTunes. Now I, being an you know an oldster like you, I get the Matt Lewis and the News reference. <laughs> I, I assume this is a play on Huey Lewis and the News, which yes. my listeners won't even know who that is. The scary part is we are now getting to an age where like people have no idea what the reference you, is. You don't know who Huey Lewis is? <laughs> Come on! <laughs> I love. I, I got to tell you that that out al- that sports album with the heart of rock and roll on it is a great album. And then. Power of Love, you know, the Back to the Future theme song. Listen, I challenge you, listen to those lyrics. It's a very uplifting and positive song. Oh, look, those, that was like the soundtrack of our childhood, those songs, right? Yeah, I know you're a prog rock fan. Yeah, but but this stuff, I mean, my kids will tell you that when I'm in the car and I don't have the iPod on, you know, we have Sirius XM. I got it on 80s on 8 all the time. <laughs> 
You know, they my kids haven't got the slightest idea what music is being produced today. They're never exposed to it. They never had a they never had a chance. You know, the other kids are talking to them about stuff they've never even heard of. And in a way, that's kind of the way I like it. But <laughs> yeah, just keep them away from Taylor Swift and keep them listening to Huey Lewis, and and they'll probably grow up with some good values. Yeah, they're doing okay. So far, so good. All right, Matt, I appreciate your time today. Best of luck. The book, once again, is Too Dumb to Fail, How the GOP Betrayed the Reagan Revolution to Win Elections and How It Can Reclaim Its Conservative Roots. Always fun talking, Matt. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. All right, that will do it for this week. Remember, I have a secret coupon page that only you folks know about for libertyclassroom.com, where we're adding courses now at breakneck speed. These are all courses you can listen to when you're on the go. And they're on – this is not the Ron Paul curriculum. That's a totally different thing. This is like an adult enrichment site where you can learn from me and Bob Murphy and Kevin Gutzman and Jeff Herbener and Brian McClanahan and regular guests of the show who all have PhDs and all have academic track records. And they're going to teach you the history and the economics you should have gotten in school, but we all know we didn't. And check out my special coupon page. It's at libertyclassroom.com slash coupons. And then you just go to the homepage, libertyclassroom.com, and you use those babies and get yourself a discount. So that's your weekend assignment. We'll see you on Monday. We're going to have some debate analysis, so don't miss that. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.